So I have a really cool job. At Northern Illinois University, I get to create the next generation of engineers. No, not that kind of engineer. There we go, that's more like it. I'm talking about the men and women who create things, who test things, who make modern technology work. One really cool course I teach is called Dynamic Systems and Control. It's all about the fundamentals of how to write algorithms for a machine to regulate or to control itself. I'm talking about small electromechanical devices, but I'm also talking about large armies of robots that can build cars. In fact, cars themselves may have computers with algorithms that's, that can automatically correct drivers' mistakes in order to keep the vehicle on the road. Computer algorithms inside jumbo jet aircraft provide a means for the plane to keep itself on track. In fact, a modern airliner can land itself. This idea of a machine self-regulating or controlling itself pushes the boundaries of technology further into the domain of the previously impossible. So how do these control algorithms and rules work? It's simple. Of course, that's easy for me to say. I live and breathe the mathematics. It has meaning to me. I see how all the pieces fit together. I see the symmetries in the equations. It's beautiful. Unfortunately, when students look at the same equations, they often see something more like this. And that's to be expected, I guess. The mathematics can be intimidating. It takes a lot of effort and hard work to make sense of it. My philosophy is that learning the material can be a burdensome chore, or it can be an interesting journey that has purpose beyond getting a good grade in the course. In 2008, I began using a video game called EDU Torx to help teach the Dynamic Systems and Control course. Even though EDU Torx has much of the look and feel of a traditional car driving game, students primarily interacted with the game through a software interface I created. Instead of spending countless hours honing one's eye-hand coordination, my students instead spent their time constructing mathematical rules for the virtual car to drive itself. Here's what I got when I asked a group of students to show me something interesting. In this case, they wrote mathematical algorithms that would make the car drive itself backwards. That's a good start. Then when they pressed a particular button on the keyboard, the car would perform a graceful flip turn at 75 miles per hour. How cool is that? And when they pushed the button again, the car would flip back around. Now this is difficult to do. The maneuvers would make any Hollywood stunt driver proud. And it's learning dynamical systems and control unlike anything you'll find in a textbook. So there's a taste of what students can do by the end of the semester, but perhaps it's more interesting to see how the video game is used to foster learning during the semester. When students receive the game at the beginning of the year, this is what it looks like. The car just sits there motionless on the track. To get the car to move, we have to write simple computer programs in C++. Let me show you how it's done. There's a variable called break that we can assign a number between 0.0, .0 and 1.0. A zero means that one's foot is completely off the brake pedal. The gear variable takes an integer. Here we're giving it a one for first gear. A variable two would put the car in second gear. Assigning a number to the throttle variable is equivalent to stepping on the gas pedal. A value of 0.0, .0 means take your foot off the gas. 1.0 means put the pedal to the metal. We'll choose 30% throttle here. Now we can save and compile our code and we can see how the car responds. So here we are, ready, a set, and away we go. Notice the car just went into first gear and it's inching forward just like we told it to. Things are looking really good. And... Oh, we forgot to steer. I guess we're back to the drawing board. Our programming interface has a variable called steer. A value of 1.0 commands the car to turn the steering wheel all the way to the left. A value of negative 1 turns the wheel all the way to the right. 0.0, .0 would tell the car to go straight ahead. Since we neglected to turn right in that previous run, why don't we give the steer variable a value of negative 0.5? This is a right turn. We'll see what happens. So we're back in the car, ready, set, go. And notice we turned right immediately, and we're going around in circles. This is not exactly what we had in mind, but if you think about it, this is exactly what we told the car to do. So we're going to have to think about it a little bit more. Let me pause this. I guess we could tell the car to go straight for a while, and then start to turn right for a while, and then what? In the upper right corner of the screen, we have a map of the track. That little red dot indicates the position of our car. Notice that after the first right turn, the car will have to go straight for a while, and then we'll have to make a, a sharp left turn, followed by a less sharp left turn, followed by a right turn, followed by a straightaway, then left, then straight, then another right. As you can see, if we hard code every turn into the program, we're going to be here for a while. There's got to be a better way. 
And there is. Let's go back to the driving program and give the steer command minus 0.2 multiplied by the variable 2 center. Now what is 2 center? Well, if we look at our handy EDU Torx reference, the API, we find that 2 center is the car's distance from the center line of the track, measured in meters. It is a signed variable, meaning that positive values indicate that the car is to the left of the center line. If 2 center is negative, then the car is to the right. If we go back to our steer command, notice that if the car is to the left of the center line, then 2 center is positive. My steer command is positive times a negative, or in other words, my steer command is negative, so the car steers towards the right. Other, likewise, if the car is to the right of the center line, the steer command is negative times a negative, which is positive, so the car steers to the left. And if the car is on the center line, then 2 center is 0. 0 times minus 0 0.2 is 0, so the car steers straight ahead. This is exactly what we want, right? The mathematical rule says steer the car towards the center line of the track always. And the further the car is away from the center, the more it steers. All right, let's run it and see if it works. Here we are approaching the first turn and looking good. Uh-oh, something's wrong. Obviously very wrong. So let's look at this again, perhaps a bit more slowly. As the program is running, our steer command gets computed, or I should say recomputed, every 0.02 seconds. So as the car wanders off the center line, the steer command responds immediately and directs it back towards the center. This idea of using the current position of the car to determine the, its steering input is called feedback. And it looks as though there might be something to it. It gets us around this first turn, but somehow this rule of always steering back towards the center seems to be doing too much. Perhaps it's overcompensating. In the bottom right corner, notice that we're plotting and recording the value of the variable 2 center as well as the steer command. Notice that our simple control rule is causing the car to oscillate back and forth and the oscillation is growing. Somehow we need to figure out how to damp out or suppress that oscillation. And this is where I hand it over to the students in the first or second week of class. I tell them, you're the engineer, now you make it work. In my experience of offering such challenges, though, students have often responded with incredibly complicated Rube Goldberg-like solutions. So to help students focus their thinking, I gave them joysticks or game pads and had them play EDU Torx more like a traditional video game. First, I asked students to drive on a long, straight segment of road. They would bring their cars up to 60 miles per hour and then perform a sustained zigzag maneuver. Notice in the bottom right corner of the screen that we are recording simulation data as well as data from the joystick input. Then I ask students to perform what I call the aggressive lane change maneuver. The car starts off on one edge of the roadway, then boom! Notice what's going on here. We removed the driving program from the feedback loop. In its place, we put the human brain, which issues its own driving commands through the joystick. Whereas our initial driving program was not able to damp out the oscillations, the human brain is able to do it marvelously. To perform the aggressive lane change maneuver with the joystick might take a little practice. However, I would argue that when we do it, we're not consciously thinking about it much. We just do it almost automatically. Locked inside our subconscious brains are amazing control algorithms. We humans are able to drive cars, ride bikes, run, jump. It's very difficult to get a robot to walk as nimbly and as gracefully as we humans can. When students are performing this exercise, they are collecting data. Then I ask students to get together, to compare their lane change data to zigzag data, and to compare across individuals to their classmates. They notice an important pattern. When the human brain damps out the oscillations, it is using a strategy that incorporates anticipation. Aha! Now students can go back to the API and look for something that provides that element of anticipation. Then they modify the driving algorithm and get their car to drive itself around the track beautifully, elegantly, simply. When it works, there's a proud sense of accomplishment. Also, students learn about two of the most important concepts of control theory, feedback and something called lead compensation. They learn it in a way that makes intuitive sense. Before I had the video game, I would teach lead compensation or derivative action like the textbook does. I would spend weeks developing the mathematical framework, Laplace transforms, transfer functions, block diagram, algebra. Then I would assemble the pieces into a mathematical demonstration of how derivative action could damp out oscillations. The diligent students would follow every step. In fact, they could recite the steps back to me. But they had a hard time seeing the big picture. 
seeing how all the pieces fit together to form the rather profound result. In my game-based course, we studied the problem with the same mathematical rigor, but only after students had the chance to see it work in a practical way and to appreciate it. In the game-based course, we build the mathematical theory on top of a foundation of intuitive understanding so that students can see the bigger picture as the theoretical framework is constructed. I claim this makes a big difference. Much of the rest of the course is structured in a similar manner as students solve additional mathematical modeling and control challenges embedded in the game.